there's not really a narrative. Well, I mean, it's like life, right? It's, it's sort of like, well, this could go somewhere, but maybe not. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Clifford Lee Sargent. Great to see you as always. Hope you're all doing well. Get that coffee. Today is outlined by Rachel Cusk. Very excited to get to this. I really enjoyed it. Rachel Cusk is a Canadian-born British author and memoirist. It sounds like she's put herself in vulnerable positions with her past memoirs, writing about her actual life, her marriage, motherhood, and divorce. And it seems like this has left critics polarized. That reminded me uh, a lot of Carl Ove Knausgaard's My Struggle. In an interview that I've linked to in the description below, Cusk said that this novel's form was an attempt to describe a moment in life, in middle age, in which someone's concept of reality fails and is dismantled. This is the first in a fictional trilogy, Outline, Transit, and Kudos. The New Yorker called the book autobiographical fiction. It's about a female writer who is traveling for work in Greece to teach her writing class in Athens. It's a book filled with conversations, beginning with a man she meets on her plane to Athens. It's a novel of observance. Very, very little is said about Faye, the writer, the narrator, the main character who is the lens we view the novel through. There are no descriptions of her. She's almost formless. We discover who she is through other people and the things she observes. And eventually you have the suggestion of a form. You have this character's outline. You have this annihilated perspective, to quote an interview with Cusk in The Guardian. There's a dry humor to the writing. It's immediately engaging, smart, minimal, composed of compact, efficient sentences, very economical. It gives me this feeling of an abundance of literary white space. Not to say it's void of content or substance, on the contrary, but it allows you to breathe, it allows you to reflect. It doesn't fill up the space with descriptions or exposition. That, for me, is refreshing after Flaubert, I gotta say. <laughs> Madame Bovary was great, but, uh, you know, th this, this was a, a, a great follow-up. It was really, relaxing to uh, just slow down and just sit and think. You get a lot of, uh, I don't know how, to, how else to put it, bang for your buck, basically, out of her sentences. They just, um, the, it's all very, very meaningful. So she's constructed a different kind of novel, and it mirrors real life in a way I've never seen done before. I suppose you could call it experimental, but I hesitate to use that term to describe it, because experimental novels tend to use extreme techniques to try and stand out. This novel isn't like that at all. It's, it, it comes off as, as almost like effortless on her part. I mean, it, it, it doesn't seem like she's trying hard. So these various people she meets, uh, friends, other writers, students, strangers, they all seem to reveal these pertinent insights to our character. It almost reminds me of uh, Waking Life by Richard Linklater, but with far less complex and philosophical musing, down to earth and um, uh, incomprehensible, but at the same time not resorting to platitudes. Uh, far from it. There's not really a narrative. Well, I mean, it's like life, right? It's, it's sort of like, well, this could go somewhere, but maybe not. You know, th there's no three-act structure. I want to say there's no plot. It's a story. I mean, it's, it's clearly recognizable as a woman's life. Maybe that's what I'll say about it. It's clearly recognizable as somebody's life. It's not contrived. It looks like real life. It feels like real life it, or, or a series of important moments in a space of time in somebody's life in a certain place. There's just enough description of Faye's world to suggest the outline uh -huh, of a narrative, but that sparse and suggestive tone gives the novel an attractive atmosphere, like revealing the contents of your unconscious while drunk in a bar or in a dream, so it's hazy, you don't really remember it. It's kind of foggy. I don't mean to suggest that the novel is incoherent, it's not. Only that the characters, with their very meaningful conversations, sort of drift in and out. It's also that sort of thing we experience where, if we're focused or fixated on something in our lives, a subject or notion, we begin to notice it, to see it in various places, we're looking for it. And it seems that the narrator is looking for people's thoughts or ideas on these subjects and uh, she is relating them to us, and that's what the novel is composed of. Uh, these, she's relating these important insights uh, that she's discovered pertaining to where she's at in her life, which is divorced. Uh, so you have thoughts and ideas from other people on different perspectives uh, between the genders, points of view from men and women, stories from them about uh, just 
life, you know, love and, and uh, being a parent and being divorced. But all the preconceived notions she had about whatever traumatic event was recently experienced, her divorce in this case, I gather, they're dropped. They're no longer present. She's open. So her story is told through others. Often these stories take on sort of a confessional tone, but we're not sure if they're telling the truth, of course, because we're only getting it from one side, from one point of view, a series of unreliable narrators, because all humans are unreliable narrators. So it's like, it just makes me think of how much trust we put in the narrators of books to begin with. We automatically place this trust in uh, the narrators. Uh, they're telling us exactly how it was and how it is, you know. Suppose we've just learned to, to have to think more critically about people that we're listening to, but there's some automatic mechanism of trust. I don't know when we're listening to another human being. It's like, why shouldn't we trust the narrator or an author of the book if they've given us no reason to disbelieve them? That's so interesting, you know, because it brings up the idea of persuasion. It's reflective, beautiful, quiet, not depressing necessarily, but heavy. Definitely leaves you saying, oh yeah, life is like that. And what are we going to do about it? The title outline refers to a conversation a woman is having with a man on an airplane, kind of a bookending theme in the novel, as it begins with the main character having a conversation with a totally different man on the airplane. So two different characters, two different airplanes, two different strangers. Anyways, the title comes from the one at the end where this woman, uh, who's a, a writer, a playwright, who has led her life very much according to her emotions, is listening to this man who sounds extremely disciplined, very deliberate and decisive in his life trajectory. Everything she is not, essentially. And subsequently, this gives her the outline of who she is, through discovering what she is not and cannot be. This is sort of an undercurrent theme I've been noticing and bringing up now and again, reading these modern novels. And certainly there's a similar atmosphere or desire through all of them, trying to understand who we will be by discovering what it is that we are not, will not, and cannot be. The authors I'm thinking of would be Michelle Welbeck, Carlo Vicknausgaard, David Saloy, and today's author Rachel Cusk. These are all very, very smart modern authors. I recommend them all. Dealing with the subject of life, love, and meaning. Various degrees of cynicism can be found in their works, but I think they're all part of this current wave of thought, so to speak, that is sort of asking the questions, what the fuck are we actually doing? Why haven't our dreams come true? Who is it we actually are when we're not fooling ourselves? And why? We never get a sense of the narrator. I'm curious what will happen in the rest of the trilogy, which I absolutely plan to read. What Cusk has done, in her own words, is omit any of the normal things about your narrator, which would traditionally be employed to get us to sympathize with them or understand their motivations or any of that stuff. Just about all we know is that she is a thoughtful, observant, and intelligent divorced writer. That's about it. Though all of them were interesting, the conversation that most resonated with me personally was the divorced father who began to discuss the narrative of progression we all have in our lives. So I wanna read that to you now. I got this version, it was like a library copy and it had all these notes in, uh, I, th I think it's Chinese, I'm not sure. Uh, it's so interesting, uh, these sticky notes in Chinese. And so I learned, he said, that it is impossible to improve things and that good people are just as responsible for it as bad and that improvement itself is perhaps a mere personal fantasy as lonely in its way as Angeliki's lonely place. We are all addicted to it, he said, removing a single muscle from its shell with his trembling fingers and putting it in his mouth. The story of improvement, to the extent that it has commandeered our deepest sense of reality. It has even infected the novel, though perhaps now the novel is infecting us back again so that we expect of our lives that we've come to expect of our books. But this sense of life as a progression is something I want no more of. In his marriage, he now realized the principle of progress was always at work, in the acquiring of houses, possessions, cars, the drive towards higher social status, more travel, a wider circle of friends. Even the production of children felt like an obligatory calling point on the mad journey, and it was inevitable, he now saw, that once there were no more things to add or improve on, no more goals to achieve or stages to pass through, the journey would seem to have run its course, and he and his wife would be beset by a great sense of futility and by the feeling of some malady, which was really only the feeling of stillness after a life of too much motion, such as sailors experience when they walk on dry land after too long at sea, but which to both of them signified that they were no longer in love. Brutal. He's a divorced father and a writer. 
We surely wouldn't want to believe that our lives are a narrative of retrogression or regression, of decline, even though at some point, let's be honest, we ain't getting any younger. But that was disturbing to think about. Maybe just as an American with all these societal indoctrinations and this American dream myth that has been fed to us since before we were born, it's encoded in our fucking DNA, this idea of progress, of this constant accumulation, this constant upward trajectory of more, you know? Always more, never less. So much so that whenever the scales tip, like they seem to be doing presently, and things actually don't get better, but rather stagnate or plateau, or need to change in some way, we're quite shocked at the intrusion of reality into our narrative. And that happens to a character in the book as well. That happens, like the intrusion of reality into her narrative, you know, her life. It's interesting to consider that there are different ways of looking at your life. Really, it sounds trite or maybe juvenile, but my constant background hum of thought has always been in the shape of accumulation and progression, I think. And even now, it's difficult for me to think outside of that. To do so means to confront my mortality, to confront my inevitable demise. One that won't really make a difference to the world at all, probably. Which is fine. I like a relatively quiet life. Do you believe me? The character who discusses the idea of the outline she's perceiving from speaking with this man on the airplane had her life completely changed upside down when she was mugged and someone tried to kill her. And after the incident, everything seems to have totally changed for her. It seems very realistic. Even her eating habits are disrupted. It's disturbing. But we all face that, or most of us at least, in our lives, several times, where not somebody trying to kill you necessarily, God, I hope not, but we experience traumatic events that completely alter our structure and view of the world, or it falls like a dead kingdom and is rebuilt. In the same interview I've linked to, she discusses the idea that women have no blueprint for the future because they're doing things that historically n no other women have, but I certainly think that men feel that way as well. For sure, things are happening that have never happened before, you know, that's why thousands of them are killing themselves here in America. Thousands, thousands are killing themselves. Life expectancy is lengthening, kind of. I'm talking more globally as opposed to America where it's actually declining because of all the suicides and overdoses. But the quality and style of living is shifting. So like the best books, Outline gives us no answers, but many more questions. Better than food, definitely. So who should read it? Certainly if you're a fan of anyone I mentioned in the review, Saloy, Knausgaard, Wellbeck, and also if you enjoy Brett Easton Ellis or Eve Babbitts, check this out. Time for the coffee lottery. Coffee lottery, for those of you who are new, so I take all the names of the patrons on Patreon who have donated $5 or more per video, I place their names in this mason jar, I pull out a name for every review, and whoever's name I pull out, I send them a hard copy of the book I'm reviewing, plus a bag of coffee, roasted by yours truly. If you would like to get in on that, you could click on the link in the description box below, or you can head to patreon.com forward slash books are better than food and donate $5 or more per video. I sincerely appreciate it. Thank you. If you donate $1 or more, you'll get access to the patron only reviews, plus the better than Friday newsletter I send out every Friday where I just give you a list of things that I'm interested in at any given moment, plus like books in the pipeline, music, sometimes films, articles, YouTube videos, all kinds of stuff. If you live outside the US, you can definitely win the coffee lottery and have a book and coffee sent to you. However, international shipping is not included. Anyways, that's my spiel. Best of luck to all the patrons. Here we go. Sean. Thanks so much, Sean. Really appreciate it. You're gonna get outlined by Rachel Cusk plus a bag of coffee. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Please hit the thumbs up if you enjoyed this video and please hit me up on Instagram and DM me and let me know which books you think are better than food. Please always remember to bring a book wherever you go. You never know when you'll have five or 10 minutes to read and then pretty soon you'll be reading more books and it just adds up. Remind other people, always bring a book. All right, take care of yourselves. Great to see you as always. Have a good night and I'll talk to you soon. Ciao.